folks, we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the 2021 Student Success Summit, um, our second virtual summit. Um, we're so grateful to have you here. Uh, my name is Erica Oriens, and I am the Executive Director of the Center for Student Success at the Michigan Community College Association. I am joined today by three of my fantastic colleagues, Precious Miller, Jenny Schenker, and Katie Giardello, who um, really were in all instrumental in putting together the programming this year. I am very grateful, uh, which you will hear throughout the presentation today, for to be able to work with such a great team every day. So thanks to all of them for presenting with us today. Um, our, we have three major items on our agenda today. Um, those of you who uh, probably know that uh, this is the 10-year anniversary of the Student Success Center, and so we'll be taking a look back at the last 10 years. Um, we will be looking forward to our student success initiatives in 2022, uh, which is uh, one of the more popular sessions that we do every year at the Student Success Center, do the center update. And then we'll just close out today with uh, Student Success Summit Week in review. Um, we have a lot of great programs scheduled for the rest of the week and some fantastic content avail available online. So we want to make sure that you're aware of what's out there. Uh, so first, I want to start with celebrating 10 years of student success. Um, the Center for Student Success was created in 2011. Um, with a generous grant from the Kresge Foundation just 10 years ago. And four visionary leaders really saw the opportunity to create an organization that is solely focused on student, student success, particularly in a state like Michigan, which has no system of higher education or statewide governing board. Um, but our colleges had a very strong commitment to student success. Caroline Altman-Smith from the Kresge Foundation, Chris Baldwin, who at the time was at Jobs for the Future, and Mike Hansen and Adriana Phelan from the Michigan Community College Association came together to create the center. The vision for the center has remained relatively unchanged uh, for the last 10 years. Um, we are really focused on serving as a hub for our 28 community colleges in their efforts to improve equitable student outcomes. And the center also plays a very significant role in MCCA's advocacy efforts in Lansing. So part of our uh, work with the association is really deeply connected to the uh, mission of the whole MCCA. Um, our initiatives have changed a lot. Um, and those of you who've been involved in a lot of our work um, know we're, we are uh, very committed to all of the MY initiatives, which we'll review throughout um, the session today. But um, we really center equity in our work and, and really emphasize um, the role of data and research to understand best practices and student success. And we continue to do that today. This idea that was really generated in Michigan was so popular and so effective that the Student Success Center Network has been expanded to 16 states. Um, those 16 states that you see on the map there uh, serve about half of the community colleges in the country. Um, we at the Center for Student Success work closely with the National Student Success Center Network that's managed by Jobs for the Future. Uh, so to achieve the vision of the center, uh, MC, uh, the Community College Association had to hire a staff. Um, and so that guy, Chris Baldwin, that you saw a couple of slides ago, who was at JFF, um, <laughs> relocated to Michigan to lead the Student Success Center. And if I understand the folklore correctly, uh, Chris knew Jenny Schenker, who was an English faculty member at Lake Michigan College and really a student success advocate in the national work for many years uh, before that. And Chris and then and Jenny then invited Michelle Taylor who provides support for center operations. And those three folks uh, founded the Student Success Center. And I'm so grateful um, that they are still with us today in, in various different capacities in the work that they do. I really truly believe that without their leadership, we wouldn't be um, where we are today. 
So even before the center was created, uh, Michigan hosted the annual Student Success Summit, and I unearthed um, this logo from, I think, way back in 2000, 2010. Um, we have tackled student success. We've lived our values. values. We've moved from information to implementation. Um, we found our pathways to possibilities, um, opportunity and equity, and we've supported healthy colleges um, in a, along with uh, living our values. Um, and we estimate that probably over 2,000 people from community colleges, 28 community colleges across Michigan have attended the Student Success Summit over the years. Um, so this has really been um, the signature work uh, for the Student Success Center, um, along with all of the other uh, work that we do throughout the year. Um, but this last week of September is uh, very special to us at the Student Success Center. But uh, we've coordinated student success work in Michigan, but we really couldn't have done that without these selected national partners that we've worked with um, who support our efforts from across the country. These organizations really have for years led student success work in our country and have taken this work that we do every day at the Student Success Center and that all of you do as well um, and created a network out of that and created professionals who are really dedicated to student success in Michigan. And I, I think I'm not alone when I think back on all of the contributions that these organizations have made to our work in Mission, Michigan and to the tens of thousands of students across the country as well. Um, we also want to recognize some of the other organizations that share our goals of improving student success. We have worked over the years with the American Association of Community Colleges, Association of Community College Trustees, and MEC um, at the regional and national level. We've worked very closely with our partners at the Michigan Association of State Universities, the Independent Colleges, and the Michigan College Access Network have all really played a major role in helping us achieve our student success goals in a, the variety of different ways that they've contributed to the work that we do. We also really rely heavily on uh, the affinity groups um, that are a kind of the collection of professionals that are across the state, which we sometimes refer to as the mix. Um, so we've got, uh, McDeck, Mixa, Modac, Macau, Macare, Macro, MLAD, CMVE, all of those organizations that we work with all the time um, to do this work. And, and really, we're a very small organization, um, just a few people working at the center. Um, but the reason that we can remain a small organization is because of really the outstanding partnership with that we have with these uh, organizations across the state of Michigan that really rely on a network of volunteers to do the work that they do every day. Um, and it's, a, it's an incredible network of people who um, try to achieve this work in the state of Michigan. I wanna recognize and thank our funders. Um, the center is supported in part by a dues assessment um, from the community colleges in Michigan. Um, but the majority of our funders has come, or the majority of our funding has come from um, philanthropy, uh, state, the state of Michigan, and, and other funders who, who really share in their boards share our goal of focusing on student success in Michigan. Um, the Kresge Foundation was the first to see the value in this kind of network, but we're so grateful to all of our other partners. Um, who have been instrumental in supporting this work um, in our organization and across the state as well. So I want to give a chance to for some of those founding partners that we talked about earlier to share some of their thoughts on the history of the Center for Student Success. So with that, I'll ask if I can turn it over to Caroline Altman-Smith. Caroline, are you with us? I am. Thank you, Erica. And thanks to all of you for being here on this Monday afternoon. Uh, my name is Caroline Altman-Smith. I'm the Deputy Director of Education at the Kresge Foundation, which is based in Troy. And as Erica mentioned, we have been so privileged uh, to be able to be the first private supporter uh, of the center all those many years ago. But 
certainly not the last. And it's been tremendous to see uh, how that list of supporters has grown over the years. Um, I love seeing that map of the 16 uh, student success centers around the whole country, knowing that Michigan was first and in my completely unbiased opinion, uh, clearly the best. Um, and I think that that's really for three reasons. Um, the first is the visionary leadership that Erica referenced um, from the early days of Adriana and Jim Jacobs kicking this idea around, Mike Hansen's willingness to think about housing this work and making it a central part of MCCA's mission, um, Chris Baldwin as the founding director, and then obviously with Erica and, and Jenny and the tremendous staff, just having that stable core of really smart, committed, passionate people willing to wake up and do this student success work um, day in and day out for the past decade uh, has really been, I think, key uh, to this endeavor. The second is all of you, um, 28 community colleges in the state um, who have been willing to show up for all of those student success summits, have been willing to share your best practices, um, share what you're hearing on the ground from students, what's working in the classroom, what's working in terms of um, institutional policies and approaches to improving student outcomes. Um, that's really the lifeblood of the work of the center. There would be no center if there weren't all of these colleges uh, willing to so actively engage and share what they're doing and what they're learning uh, and to enable the center and MCCA to take what you're learning on the ground and help feed that up into uh, policy and practice recommendations more broadly. Um, and third uh, reason I think for this success is the center has become the partner that I believe the state government and certainly many uh, foundations really need. Um, we're, we're just sitting like in an office park uh, many miles away from an actual community college student. And so to be able to have folks who have that deep relationship with people in the colleges are much more closer to the ground than we are kind of feeding us those ideas, shaping up um, opportunities for funding that will hopefully lead to impact. Um, it's just been an absolutely critical partnership role um, for us in helping us uh, make progress on our own goals around boosting community college student success in Michigan and elsewhere. So we're just so proud of where the center has been. Uh, we know there are bright things ahead and um, we're really excited to continue uh, this partnership for the next decade. Thanks. Great, thanks Caroline. And we'll turn it over to Chris. Good afternoon, everybody, and, and thank you for uh, joining us this afternoon, and thanks for inviting me, Erica. This is, it's really um, sort of mind-boggling, really, that it's been 10 years. It's been, um, there's a lot that's happened in the 10 years in Michigan and across the country, but um, I've just been really so pleased to be, have been a part of Michigan uh, Center for Student Success Growth, but also uh, the growth of the national network. And I'm gonna talk about that network in a second, but I will say, you know, going back to when the Michigan Center was launched, I was at JFF at the time, and, and a lot of these conversations grew out of the work, uh, at least from my perspective, grew out of the work of, of states and colleges in achieving the dream. And so a lot of this wouldn't have been possible without that initiative. And, and I think, that, you know, the, the folks, the visionaries that led that work uh, deserve a, a great deal of credit as well. I will say that before I came to Michigan, there were a number of states that were thinking about needing state level folks. I was working on state policy work at, at JFF, supporting the Achieving the Dream states that were involved in their individual institution. And a lot of states, Michigan chief among them, were really trying to wrestle with how do we better support individual institutions as they try to grow and or try to implement and improve the outcomes of their students. And what can we do to support that hard work of reforming what they do? And from that conversation came this notion of the Student Success Center. And, and I will say that in, in the summer of 2010, um, there were three or four states that were really talking about this concept. Um, Michigan, Arkansas, Pennsylvania at the time, uh, I think Ohio was in those conversations, and, and I had an opportunity to, to talk with those folks, um, but Michigan got ahead of the game um, th than most, although I will say, if Mike Leach from Arkansas were on the call, Caroline, he would, he would argue about who was first, and so um, I always give him credit because I don't ever want him to think that, you know, we, we uh, stole their idea, but we, we, we all were really talking about this idea together. And I think the really important thing is that there was this energy around trying to help institutions do the important work that they were doing on behalf of their students. And, and we were very fortunate to be able to, to get the support from Kresge early on and, and start the work here in Michigan very early on. But Ohio's work, 
Michigan's work, Arkansas's work, Texas's work, that those states were really the early adopters of this model. And the other 12 states really benefited from, quite frankly, us fumbling around about what this thing was. Um, it got to be later on when JSF and other partners started to think about how do we catalyze and, and codify what's going on in, in, in these really leading states around helping the institutions help their students. And so I was, uh, after I left uh, my role with the Michigan Center, I went back to JFF and had the great fortune of working with many of those additional states to launch student success centers. And it's been a real privilege to just see this, this idea blossom and grow. And, but it, 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 as with all innovation, you have to have early adopters. And you have to have people that are willing to step forward, take some risks, take some chances, mess up, make mistakes, learn from those mistakes, and move on. And all of all of you on this on this uh, webinar and folks that aren't on this webinar have contributed mightily to that to the success of the Michigan Center and the National Network. And it's not that is not an overt exaggeration. It is very true that this wouldn't have blossomed the way it did without uh, just the colleges and the practitioners and the faculty embracing this idea as a vehicle to help them do the things they want to do for their students. So I'm really excited to be a part of this. Erica, thank you again for inviting me and, and congratulations to all of you. Thanks, Chris, and I'll turn it over to you, Mike. Well, thank you, Erica. Um, and first of all, congratulations to uh, really a, a truly successful uh, launch here of, of this uh, summit this afternoon. And it was really special for me and I know a lot of us to take this trip down memory lane uh, 10 years ago, thinking about you know, the conversations that we were having. The, the, the group that I also wanna add to our list of uh, uh, folks that were inspirational and supportive and we couldn't have done this without them is frankly our board of directors. Um, you have to understand that that for probably 25 years before 2010, the primary, if not the only, uh, public policy agenda for the association was focused on state appropriations and how do we increase that pot and how do we get more money distributed to colleges through the appropriations process. Um, I had, you know, many of you know, I had worked at the Senate Fiscal Agency for 18 years prior to coming to the uh, Community College Association. And when I was, when I got there in 2006, you know, the writing was already on the wall in terms of what looked, uh, what the, the, the outlook for the state budget in the next couple of years was going to look like. And frankly, it was not very pretty at all. And so, uh, you know, things were just lining up right for us to say, you know, it may be time not to focus, not to join all the other interest groups outside of the appropriations committees with our hands out fighting for scraps. Instead, starting to ask the question, what other policy and, and pol uh, public policy uh, issues could we be focusing on that would at the same time help our colleges, help the state move forward, and more importantly, help students become more successful in, in their in, in, uh, endeavor and agenda uh, through the community college system and network. And so that's when, you know, Adriana, Mike Wall and I would have conversations about, okay, you know, maybe it's time to start thinking a little more creatively uh, about an expanded agenda, public policy agenda that would help our institutions not cost the state any more money but still be beneficial to our institutions and to our students. And so that's um, at the same time that, you know, as Chris mentioned, achieving the dream and, and many of these other student success initiatives were starting to spring up. And we said, maybe this is the time to actually create a center within the association that was focused solely on student success. And so the conversation that we then brought to our board Remember, our board was was under the mindset, no, the only thing we want you to focus on, Mike, is state appropriations to say, no, we want to actually create this center for student success within the Community College Association to help your institutions. And we're and, and it's we're not going to, you know, and at least initially go after state funding to do this. 
Um, that was a fairly large leap uh, of faith that the board uh, put in the association and, uh, and Adriana and, and me to say, yeah, let's do this. The time is right. Um, and so we approached uh, Kresge and, and, and Caroline and others. And so um, it, was, it was born out of a, a sort of a perfect storm of conditions that really uh, led to the creation of this center. And, and looking back, you know, I mean, we couldn't be prouder of the work that um, resulted from this and the leadership that um, you know, the center has taken, not just in Michigan, where a number of issues could not have been possible that we've been working on, transfer you know, a chief among them, but many other, you know, all our work on dual enrollment and some of these other statewide policy initiatives would not have happened without the work of the center. So um, you know, we, we, it, it really uh, changed the whole sort of focus and direction and, and thinking of our board and uh, that remains uh, committed to a broader policy agenda today because of the early work and early success of the center. So thanks uh, for that, Erica. And I will turn it now over to Dr. Adriana Phelan. Thank you, Mike. Caroline and Chris, it's great to see both of you and everyone else. Um, thanks, Erica, for inviting me to be part of the celebration. Uh, you know, over the weekend, I took a little bit of a trip down memory lane and uh, dug up the original concept paper for the center. It was written back in August of 2010. So we think back to August of 2020, uh, 2010, right? A lot was going on. Apple had just released uh, their iPad. Social media was just becoming uh, a bigger part of everyday life. You know, Mark Zuckerberg was actually on the cover of Time as the person of the year in 2010. Uber was just being launched. Uh, we were already back then worrying about the potential for the swine flu, the H1N1 virus pandemic. You know, none of us could have predicted where we would have found ourselves a year later. And importantly, Barack Obama was in the beginning of his presidency. And as you know, he was a pretty big supporter of community colleges. So even though we were in the really sort of relatively nascent um, phase of the student success movement, there was just a lot of energy and interest in improving student success and maximizing the community college system, really thinking of it as a core social justice organization within communities. So the timing was right, as Mike talked about. In Michigan, community colleges were really moving fast in this space, making progress on a number of fronts to improve student success and including our participation on a number of these national initiatives, achieving the dream, breaking through, shifting gears, you know, but as we went uh, to, from meeting to meeting, uh, to room to room, you know, different rooms, uh, often with the same people, we started to kind of ask the question about, you know, how are all of these initiatives really connecting with each other? I mean, we really started to feel this sort of disconnect um, and, and the clear miss of the opportunity and build synergies, cross-pollinate ideas, share promising practices. I mean, it became very real to us as we went from like meeting to meeting for all of these various initiatives, right? And, and we know that initiatives really do play a very powerful role in seeding, incubating change. But at that time, we needed to start finding a way to move beyond the initiatives and really have a more coherent approach to supporting the colleges and the work. Um, you know, those of you that were around then remember what became really sort of a, our, our mantra was, you know, that we needed to move beyond the, we're going to, you know, shift gears to break through in order to achieve the dream. So no worker left was left behind, you know, it was like this, all of these initiatives, not even to mention the deep work that was going on by the institutions with AQIP, right? The Academic Quality Improvement Work for Accreditation or Sequin, the Continuous Quality Improvement Network. It was sort of this proverbial alphabet soup of acronym and initiative. So we started to tell that story as simply as we could. So the why for the Center for Student Success was really grounded on a couple important pillars. First was to create the state level hub to help colleges learn from each other, collaborate and share ideas. But in essence, we wanted to build a community. We wanted to build a community focused on the mission of, of advancing student success, right? And then second, we wanted to facilitate taking 
the research and the learnings and translate that to public policy discussions. We also saw that as a pretty significant opportunity for the center. So really in short, we wanted to be more intentional. We wanted to be more collaborative and strategic in our efforts. Um, as we shared that concept with our presidents, they very quickly saw the value of this collective action in the space. And we really honestly found um, a kindred spirit in Caroline Altman Smith at Kresge. I mean, Caroline was absolutely instrumental in helping us shape the concept for the center, gently prodding, reviewing drafts, asking questions, sort of always steadfast in her support of the growth of the center, always. Um, over the years, I would really say that Caroline and Kresge's support has really, really helped us in our journey to really close the knowing doing gap, right? Learning, experimenting and having evidence sort of knowing what helps and then doing the things that truly help students succeed. So as we sort of move forward to, um, you know, the next decade here, I, I really love Henry Ford's um, kind of words. I think about it often that rather you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Right, so uh, let's keep thinking. We can actually continuously to imagine this work. Let's think we can do this work differently, more innovatively, continue to innovate the very idea of the center, you know, for the next decade. So never give up on student success work. You are in really, really good company. Oh, thank you all so much. That was so wonderful to hear that. I, I know there are, I'm looking through our list of participants here and there are a lot of people who were here in 2011 and probably remember um, some of those early student success summits and some of the early work that we did. And, but I think there are folks here as well who are new. Um, and I think hearing some of that history about how that came to be is so helpful. So I appreciate all of you um, taking us on a trip down memory lane about how all of this work got started. So thanks so much. Um, I always learn so much from listening to Adriana, and I think I pulled two things out of that, you know, really building a community here in Michigan of community colleges and making that connection and contributing to the community that's out there. Um, and then shifting from knowing to doing. And there's one thing I've learned in my uh, six years working with all of you in Michigan is there is a lot of doing happening and lots of people are ready to do. Um, so we want to just take a few moments and, and walk through uh, some of the doing that we've done um, over the last 10 years. And uh, we, when we were pulling this presentation together, we really wanted to think about what we feel like are important student success priorities for us. Um, being part of the association and, and working in a small organization, we have to make choices about what matters to us and what matters to our colleges and where we are the right people to lead some of this work in Michigan. So we wanted to feature uh, some of those projects that we've had over the years. And, uh, you know, like a, like a good higher ed person, I, I start by thinking about uh, how students uh, come to our institutions and, and walk through the student experience. And really since nearly the beginning of the center, um, we've refocused on redesigning developmental education. And that work has come in a variety of different forms over the years. Um, Chris Baldwin and I have often remarked over the years that uh, the important work of accelerating gateway course completion would not be possible without the leadership and expertise of Jenny Schenker at the center. And um, I would also add to that the tenacity of Jenny um, to continue to focus on this topic and really see this as one of the most crucial equity issues in community colleges. And that's why the center started doing this work 10 years ago and uh, with programs like ALP, um, continued to do this work with the right math at the right time, um, and then amped that up with the My Start to Finish project. And today really leading the community college's perspective on uh, some of the work that we're doing to comply with uh, the reconnect requirements. Um, so I think this was uh, a crucial uh, part of the history of the Student Success Center. 
Um, the other thing that I think is really important to remember is that Michigan was one of the first states to uh, adopt the guided pathways model. Um, in 2014, um, certainly with support of the Kresge Foundation and guidance from our outstanding national partners, really led by the Community College Research Center, um, Michigan decided to go down the path of guided pathways. And if, as I hear the stories from Chris and Jenny, the original thought was maybe just a few institutions would wanna do this. And then um, when Chris and Jenny took this to um, the MCCA board, it turned out that just about everybody said that they should be doing this. And so I can't say enough that I think prior to my arrival, um, knowing that Michigan was one of those early adopters of uh, the guided pathways work really was essential um, to trans transforming our community colleges. And at some point in one of our Zoom meetings with the MCCA presidents in the last year, someone remarked that Surely Guided Pathways created the conditions for us to be able to weather the storm of the pandemic a little better. Um, colleges were had some of those practices in place that have been so essential for us to connect with students over the last 18 months. Uh, we are continuing to do this work now. Um, we uh, supported our Guided Pathways Institute for six years, and now with the support of uh, the Ascendium Education Group, we're continuing that work uh, through our Strengthening My, work My Workforce Pathways work as well. Um, as Mike mentioned really from, again, from the beginning, uh, one of the very first issues that the Student Success Center tackled was really focused on transferring or uh, improving transfer student outcomes. Um, that work really began with the redesign and relaunch of the Michigan Transfer Agreement. Uh, that is seven years old now, um, and we're taking a look at that again. Um, but uh, we launched the Michigan Transfer Agreement. We worked very closely um, with our colleagues in the Michigan Association of Collegiate Registrars and Admissions Officers, uh, along with the independent colleges and public universities to redesign the Transfer Network website. I will say the award-winning Transfer Network website. Um, and also brought together over a thousand faculty members and staff to build the My Transfer Pathways. Um, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with what those are, um, but it's really been outstanding work, not only to transform the experience of students, but to bring together faculty and staff in their disciplines from across the state to do this work. Um, we uh, remarked in many of those meetings how, uh, how important it was uh, for the center to play a role, along with our partners, in bringing together faculty in those disciplines who um, we heard many times haven't seen each other since graduate school. So it was just a really wonderful experience to bring folks together. Um, we continue to do that uh, in our Strengthening My Workforce Pathways, where later next year we will be launching several new agreements um, with our university partners so that students who have completed an associate degree in an applied degree program are able to move on and complete their bachelor's degree as well. This work would really not have been possible without the leadership of Katie Giardello and her tireless support of transfer students. So much so that she decided to go back to graduate school and focus her dissertation on transfer students as well. So thanks to Katie for that terrific work. And Katie also, in addition to her passion for transfer students, has a passion for serving veterans um, and service members. And uh, thanks again to the Kresge Foundation for support uh, in our partnership with the Consortium of Michigan Veterans Educators. Um, Casey, K Katie also worked with several colleges to build transfer agreements so that military personnel who were trained at the medical education training campus at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas can come to a Michigan community college and complete their associate degree and enter the labor market, typically in healthcare professions. And then our collaboration with the Michigan Veterans Affairs Agencies to ensure that veterans can get connected with community colleges as well. 
Our newest project uh, focuses on student basic needs. Um, in 2019, the Student Success Center was selected by the ECMC Foundation to be one of seven organizations selected for their student basic needs initiatives. Um, we did not have a crystal ball in 2019, and we didn't know that the pandemic would be coming just a few months later. But it turns out that this, the foundation of this work um, has been, I, I just can't express how much this has been uh, so valuable to our community colleges. Um, I encourage you, you'll hear a little bit more about this later and attend a couple of sessions on Friday, or no, Thursday, sorry. Uh, it won't disappoint. We are featuring some outstanding work um, at community colleges to meet basic needs. Um, we are also partnering with the Department of Health and Human Services to become my Bridges partners and have been accepted to a project with the Association of Community College Trustees to bring the SNAP ENT program to Michigan. Uh, for those of you who are not involved in my best, um, you uh, probably don't know our colleague Precious Miller, who is the newest addition to the center staff and really has been an outstanding advocate for this work and her, brings her expertise at the intersection of higher education and social services and, and just as really an invaluable member of our team um, that we are grateful for her leadership on this work as well. And finally, um, I want to focus about a little bit on student outcomes. And uh, I, we were just in a meeting earlier today where we were talking about helping colleges with data. And uh, we really intentionally think about this around analyzing student outcomes and the role that we can play in that. Um, it's so crucial to know what's happening before we try to do something to fix it, which sounds simple to say, but sometimes we skip over that process. And so um, the partnership that we've had with these organizations to expand access to data that colleges need, but also to support colleges in analyzing the data that they have. Um, the worst case scenario is when colleges are data rich and analysis poor. And I think a lot of the work that we've tried to do over the years is to address um, where there may be barriers in data access and also support colleges as they think about analyzing student outcomes. So that was about an 11 minute overview of the last 10 years of the Center for Student Success. Um, it's been a busy 10 years. We thought about adding up all the events and attendees and Zoom meetings and webinars and workshops and cookie platters, but really it's just too many to count. Um, and the numbers really don't matter as much as the relationships. And I think many of our guests spoke to that as well. Um, the former president at North Central Michigan College, Cameron Burnett Cook, used to say to me every time I saw her that the most important thing that we do is connect colleges to each other um, and provide a venue for colleges to learn from each other. So I very much value my relationship with the visionaries that started the Center for Student Success, the center staff, the association staff, and really hundreds and maybe even thousands of people that we work with at Michigan Community Colleges. So I'm proud of those relationships and I'm grateful to all of you for the work that you do with us to support student success. And now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Katie Girardello, to introduce a special tribute to student success that we prepared. Thanks, Erica. As Erica said, the relationships are very important. The cookies are also important. We do miss the cookies. Um, but what's most important are the students. And as we were thinking about the best way to celebrate 10 years of student success through the center, the best way that we could think of to highlight what this work does, what the work you all do um, for your communities does is, is to hear directly from students. So we have had some fun over the last few years with some videography and we, um, particularly enjoyed having some students come on board for a series of short video clips. We are going to show one today and I have to tell you trying to pick one is like trying to pick a favorite child. We all have them, but we don't say it out loud, right? Um, but we are going to let uh, Catrice Qualls, who is a fantastic student from Schoolcraft College, speak for her peers and tell you why your student success work matters so much. 
All right, technical break here. Katie, can you see my Zoom, my YouTube? Yes. yes. All right. All right. I'm going to get this in full screen. Katie, give me a thumbs up if you can hear it. What motivated me to begin Community College was a very simple decision. It was me making the decision to not put my family further in debt. You know, it was me making the decision to make the obviously, you know, smart choice, which is choosing an environment that was more small, was intimate for me, and would that provide the resources that you generally just don't get at a bigger university. It's a community. It's really truly a network. So having that close-knit network, having the resources to say that, yes, as a non-traditional student, we can take time off if we need there in between. That's why this pathway is so very unique. That's the difference between this and university. You don't have to worry about where you are. You're meeting someone else's timeline. Community College is here for you on your time. And this is, this is a huge deal for me for so many reasons, not just for myself, not just so that I can show my children, but for me to show other women, for me to show other individuals, period, no matter whether they're a non-traditional student, whether they're a veteran, whether there's somebody that they started on the track five years ago, 10 years ago, and they wanted to do something more, they thought they couldn't, there is an opportunity. The door is always open to choose community college and choose an avenue that's gonna put you on track for success. So for me, it's just continuing to help set the community up for success. So that's what gave me my voice was knowing that there was something that I needed to do, but just figuring out how I could align my passion with my purpose and community college gave me the opportunity to do that. Thank you. I apologize for the audio. If, if you were hearing a little bit of an echo, I did place in the chat the direct link to both Catrice's video, as well as all five of the student stories and the fantastic college feature videos that you hear a little bit more about later um, so that you can find them on our YouTube playlist. Great. Thank you, Katie. Um, yeah, there are five great videos. Um, I, I mean, who doesn't love hearing from students? Um, and so I really encourage you to go out and take a look at those. There's some really great stories um, out there that uh, are from our student, from your students. So um, congratulations to all of you for the for the work you do. So, okay, now I'm going to transition back to the PowerPoint as seamlessly as I can, and. Okay, so our next topic, um, those of you may or may not know um, that the president of the MCCA, Mike Hansen, is retiring this year. And Mike uh, has led the MCCA for 15 years. Uh, and you, you heard from him a little bit earlier. And honestly, the passion that he speaks about today 15 years after he started doing this is the passion that he has had about this work for the entire time he's been at the MCCA. And even though he's retiring, I swear, I think he could probably keep doing this for 15 more years. Um, he's really that um, passionate about community colleges. I, I don't want to give him a re another retirement job, but if you are ever looking for someone who can speak about how important it is to be an advocate and to call your policymakers. And he truly believes that it does make a difference um, to engage with your policymakers and to engage in um, the policymaking process in Lansing. So the staff at the center, um, we have been talking about how we want to honor Mike um, since he announced his retirement, which I think was over nine months ago now. Um, and we have been trying to think of really every way that we could do this. And uh, what we did decide to do is I think something that is so important to Mike, if, you, if any of you know Mike, he is a music lover. And I have been at many, many meetings with Mike where uh, we have student guests come in and, and do musical performances. And I've never seen him smile more than when he hears uh, what students are doing at community colleges. So with that, Mike, 
um, we want to share with you another video. I know the audio is probably not working that well, um, but I am going to try and Jenny, if you want to give me a thumbs up once I play to make sure that we can hear it. was really something. Um, I certainly am incredibly humbled by that. You're right. Music is a big part of my life. And uh, it's, it's a great way. It's always got an inspirational message. And, and sometimes music says things that the spoken word can't. In this case, it would be the same. Uh, I, I did particularly like the analogy of the, the conductor of the orchestra. You know, I was really fortunate and lucky enough to be the conductor here of this orchestra, but it was all the musicians uh, that made the music, you know, that brought the, brought the work together, that took the words on the page and the concepts and the ideas and, the, um, and actually made it reality, made it something beautiful. Um, so I am so appreciative and honored to have worked with people like all of you on this call that um, made great music together. So thank you so much for that. That was really, really great. Well, Mike, I'm glad you started talking. I could, I could stop crying. Um, so <laughs> we, we really appreciate it. Um, I, I uh, well, it's hard for me to say more right now, but... Uh, Thank you. Congratulations, Mike. Mm -hmm.
we decided we were all going to cry in unison. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. So, um, yes, we, uh, you know, we tried to think of many gifts. We'll, we'll still take you to dinner. Don't worry. You know, <laughs> we'll still do something fun, but, right. um, we just, we, uh, we really appreciate that. And, and I know that, uh, your love of, of student music is, is another great thing as well. And, and I, we, we appreciate your leadership, but we also wanted to share that with you too. I don't know if Marshall's on this, uh, zoom or not Marshall Washington, but, uh, what a voice Marshall, who knew? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if he could join us today, but, uh, yes, as you saw, uh, here comes the sun was performed by, uh, the faculty and staff at Kalamazoo Valley Community College um, for some of their commencement ceremonies at the end of the year in 2020. Um, and as we said at the end of the video, uh, please share uh, any YouTube videos that you have from your students with us. We'd love to add them to the playlist for Mike. I can guarantee you he will listen to it. Um, <laughs> I've been in his car. He listens to music all the time. So um please, please share that with us and um, we will get that to Mike and we'll have links to all of the uh, YouTube videos on, on our uh, website as well. So thanks again, Mike. Thank you. Yeah. So we will transition back to the slideshow. Okay, can you all see my screen okay? Okay, great. Okay, so with that, let's transition to uh, the what we describe as the always popular, never disappointing annual center update. Um, we evaluate the, you know, the sessions at the Student Success Summit every year. And we think, boy, why do people want just an update on all of our projects? But it is the best evaluated session of the entire summit. So uh, we do it every year because I think everybody likes to hear what we're doing all in one place. And so with that said, I will turn it over to my colleague, Precious Miller, to talk about my best. Thank you, Erica. And good afternoon to every one of you. It is such a pleasure and an honor to bring you this year's uh, My Best Update um, for those of you who were instrumental in the foundation of the center. I believe that My Best is uh, a perfect fruit um, example of the hard work and dedication that you all poured into the center. And so it's it's such a pleasure to give this update this year. Uh, as Erica mentioned earlier, I am uh, my, my name is Precious Miller and I am the coordinator of My Best, uh, one of the newest additions to uh, the center. And I have the opportunity to work with some incredible institutions to uh, lead the work of My Best, which is an initiative that focuses on institutions designing systematic strategies to really address and combat the non-academic barriers that our students are facing and are at our campuses. This is accomplished through the scaling of four guiding principles, which are understanding student needs, connecting students to campus supports, bringing community resources closer to students, as well as ensuring that students have access to the supports that are available to them. That includes both on and off campus resources. So through the scaling of these principles, we have seen some really groundbreaking efforts from our colleges. And this is uh, prior to the pandemic, but definitely at the onset of uh, COVID-19. From mobile food pantries to increasing mental health supports, both uh, telehealth as well as in person, developing student intake forms to better understand and anticipate student needs has been instrumental for a lot of our students. We've also seen seen uh, an, an increase in cross-college collaboration and cross-training events. These accomplishments have been amazing to celebrate and it's an honor to be a part of this work. Earlier this year, we also released uh, My Best Publication, also written in partnership with Dawn Coleman. And the publication is titled The Intersection of Economic Stability and Student Success. This report further details institutional implementation of the guiding economic stability practices. So the graph that you see here is an excerpt from our publication and displays the comparative data of colleges increasing the implementation of the practices 
to ensure that the holistic needs of our students are, are met. Uh, we also have seen our colleges actively engaging the voices of our students to inform uh, the revision of many college practices. So I encourage all of you to check out our publication. Um, it is clear to me that community colleges continue to be the leaders in ensuring economic stability for Michigan students and the publication just raves of, of that work. So um, understanding the experience has been a heavy focus over the last year as institutions work to implement strategies and supports uh, that are informed by the student voice. So in partnership with Trellis Research, the Student Financial Wellness Survey was launched in fall 2020. This was an amazing partnership because it gave us insight into topics like financial wellness, uh, basic need security, and institutional support. We had over 10,000 responses. Can you believe it? 10,000 responses. 10,000 students wanted to share their voice with us. And from their input, we learned that 70% of students worry about having enough money to pay for school, and 86% of students reported the COVID-19 pandemic adding to their levels of stress, anxiety, or depression. So from the survey, what we learned um, is that community colleges are instrumental uh, partners in supporting students and their basic needs. Um, community colleges um, and their work, I have... Um, <laughs> My five-year-old decided to um, join our session today. So if you hear um, him in the background, that's, um, that's my oldest son, Kai. Um, so from the survey, um, our institutions are making groundbreaking um, strides to support the holistic needs of our students. Wait. Uh, <laughs> Another my best partner to highlight this year is Public Policy and Associates. PPA is a national leader in research evaluation and strategic consultation. And so uh, PPA supported the um, work at um, Kalamazoo Valley Community College, Bay College, Lansing Community College, and Oakland Community College to facilitate student focus groups at those institutions. And over 40 students participated in virtual sessions with PPA. Um, from, from the focus groups, we learned that um, students wanted to um, ensure that institutions knew that they want um, to hear about supports from a variety of communication streams, but they also wanted us to know that students um, have a variety of different needs from um, older students to those students who are returning to the classroom. So with these recommendations, well, institutions are uh, making more dedicated efforts to make systems more robust for students and ensuring that all institution members are aware and are able to refer students to services. So thank you to PPA. Uh, with a year remaining in the project, if you can believe it, we have set our sights on providing content and coaching in the areas of communication, um, communication both student-facing as well as college-facing uh, communication improvement. Uh, we are also looking to integrate feedback loops into student services, allowing for colleges to gauge the success of their communication efforts with students. Strengthening community partnerships is also another focus for the coming year as a key principle in student financial stability is connecting students to community resources and you can definitely learn more about that in our publication. Uh, SNAP ENT is another area Mama. of focus that uh, Erica mentioned earlier in our presentation. Mama. Can I do it? Not this time, son. It's mommy's turn. Mm. When I'm all done, you can have a turn. Okay. No. <laughs> so um, I um, encourage all of you to stay tuned because uh, it is clear that the center is innovative and progressive as far as making sure that our colleges have access to the supports that they need. And that includes expanding the work that we're doing with uh, college students who are also SNAP recipients. Uh, we will um, be sharing more about that in the year to come. So if you have enjoyed the My Best Update thus far, I assure you we have literally only scratched the surface. Um, this Thursday, September 23rd, we will have two sessions that center other key elements of My Best. So the morning session, we will highlight the innovative work of Grand Rapids Community College, Mott Community College, 
West Shore and West Shore Community College. We will also uh, take virtual tours of all of these institutions. Um, like many of you, I have been housebound with my family. And one thing that I have really missed is being able to um, get out and explore the spaces of our institutions. And so this session will definitely give all of us that opportunity. We will also hear from each college during that time. Wait. And then our closing session will feature our keynote speaker, Dr. Dominic Hammonds, backed by popular demand. Um, she is going to charge us all to dig deeper into the practices of self-care because it positions us to bring ease, excellence, and enjoyment to our spheres of influence in all of our work. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share my son and give you all an update about the center. Awesome. I think it's my turn. Uh, and my sons are in the basement with a snack and a television. So <laughs> hopefully they'll um, uh, hang out down there uh, as we finish up the presentation this afternoon. Precious, I can't say enough about the good work that you've been doing and our colleagues at the campuses who are um, coming with you on that journey. I think the My Best Project is fantastic. Um, and as much as I love to evangelize about transfer and supporting service members, I think what you're doing and what the colleges are doing to support um, students with financial need and um, bolster their their basic needs is just tremendous. Um, transition to some of the work we've been doing on transfer. Uh, we would have been remiss if we did not let you know that we we continue to work through transfer, even though some of the formal projects related to uh, the statewide transfer work here in Michigan are are no longer being funded. Um, the Michigan Transfer Network, as you all know, was uh, funded through a one-time state appropriations grant several years ago, and we worked with a number of, uh, of you on this call and other colleagues to make sure that we were designing a website that would be very useful for students and for faculty and staff across the state. We are very glad to let you know that that has materialized, although it has been a couple of years now and some of the tools and resources came online at the same time that the pandemic did. So we are looking at opportunities to update and refresh the site for our public users and get some of our uh, campus users using the back end resources, which are very robust, a little bit more heartily. Um, I'm looking forward to infusing some of those back end resources into some of our current projects. And we are always available to provide um, help and assistance if you all uh, need, have needs for uh, training or other support related to the Michigan Transfer Network. If you've not heard of this website and you haven't checked it out, I would be shocked because most of you have probably heard about it <laughs> ad nauseum. Uh, but check it out at my transfer, am I transfer.org and see what uh, resources are available to the general public. And then um, if you don't have back end access, uh, certainly look for your key holders on your campus who do, because there are a number of really robust reports and um, other tools that can be accessed. We are getting ready to, uh, as I said, make some updates and certainly we'll be sharing that out through a number of networks that are interested in my transfer. Likewise, as Erica alluded to earlier, the Michigan Transfer Agreement, which is the updated macro agreement, some of you may have been familiar with the macro transfer agreement, um, has been online now for seven years, which is kind of wild. Uh, it came online right before I started at MCCA in 2015, and it was implemented with lots of gusto at that time. And then um, folks have continued to work through some processing issues as they implemented MTA, and we continue to keep an eye on the curricular distribution since we know that curriculum is dynamic and gen ed requirements have changed in the two-year and the four-year sector across the state and certainly across the country. So we have convened at the um, direction of the Michigan Transfer Steering Committee and our colleagues over at MACRO an MTA 3.0 group. And some of you on the call will remember the MTA 1.0 and then the MTA 2.0 groups um, that have been really dedicated to making sure the MTA works as it should for students and is fairly seamless for institutions. We are um, dealing with some lingering issues that have been present from the beginning, uh, figuring out how alternative forms of credit like AP, CLEP, IB, and other forms of PLA might fit into the MTA. Um, considering how we might be able to create new and more robust training resources for uh, advisors and other staff who may not be as familiar with the MTA as when it came out in 2014. Um, and the biggest piece of um, action that will be coming forward is a survey that the committee has been working on for several months now to assess how it's going and um, how many students are using the MTA, how the curriculum is lining up between your general education 
um, packages and the MTA package itself. And that survey will come out early in 2022. And then we will be able to um, hopefully get some results and uh, analyze those results and then figure out what we might need to do next collaboratively as a state to make sure that that's working um, and is equitable for students and working well for institutions. Similarly, our My Transfer Pathways, which um, is one of the things I am most proud of in my time at MCCA, um, these are statewide multi institutional associate to baccalaureate transfer pathway agreements. That's a mouthful, but it's literally what it is. These documents on the website, um, the agreement documents, actually outline what is necessary to receive an associate degree from participating institutions that will transfer and apply toward baccalaureate requirements in 10 disciplines at participating four year institutions. And again, very proud of the work that went into this partially because we had the opportunity to work with nearly 1,000 faculty and staff members across the state to help us develop these and make sure that they would work as we intended for them to do. Um, if you can believe it, these are going to be up for renewal next year. Uh, June 30th, 2022 is the shelf life kind of end date, uh, three years on those uh, agreements. We did have a little bit of hiccup in the middle of that with the pandemic, um, but we expect that the renewals should go pretty smoothly across those disciplines and you'll be able to get more detail from um, MCCA on how that process will go down as we get closer to it. And I'm excited that we have several, um, I was supposed to say this in the last slide, but it's okay, you don't have to go back. Um, we have several new projects online that are focused uh, on transfer, but in a slightly different capacity. So Erica, um, you'll hear more in, in a moment. And Erica spoke earlier about our new um, My Workforce project, which will be expanding some transfer pathways into applied bachelor's degree programs. And we are very excited to kind of be on the cutting edge of that work across the country. And also excited to be collaborating with the Community College Research Center on our Strengthening My Humanities project, which is funded by the Mellon Foundation. Uh, CCRC is doing some quantitative and qualitative research um, kind of studying the process that we are using. Jenny and I are co-leading this project and um, co-leading with a variety of faculty members as well. So you can see there's a theme here. We have a core group of faculty leads in four disciplines that are helping us set the stage for this project, which will uh, heat up this fall. And we'll also look to strengthen transfer pathways, which Jenny will tell you more about. Thanks. Yeah, um, we have uh, we have work. We're working with the Community College Research Center, and we and the Mellon Foundation. Um, we we spent a lot of time talking to the Mellon Foundation about the uh, disciplines that we would be that would be selected for the humanities. So we have three disciplines, three div deliverables in four disciplines that would be communication, English, history, and theater. The um, you you know that we have established a My Transfer Pathway in Communication. Um, we, you may know that we attempted to um, get a pathway started in English and hit some major snags and were unable to um, come to any agreement about a, a clear pathway in English. We're really excited to have the opportunity through this um, project to kind of shore up the communication pathway and use that as kind of an, an example of how um, a, a discipline in the humanities can uh, create these, these pathways um, to circle back with the English faculty and try to resolve some of our unresolved issues. And then possibly to um, create new pathways in history and in theater. Um, three, de three deliverables. Uh, so we're gonna be strengthening those transfer pathways. Um, from associate to bachelor's degree as far as possible. Um, enhanced teaching and learning and the light the fire experiences for students in lower division courses. So how can we make sure that students are having um, the opportunity wherever they're starting their journey um, to have experiences that will excite them about pursuing the humanities and hopefully help them move along the pathway. Um, so mark your calendars for a Strengthening My Humanities Faculty Gathering, um, October 22nd, uh, coming up next month. We're very excited. Um, we're, invite, we're inviting faculty and administrators in communication, English, history, and theater to join us. 
And uh, we will be communicating that out more broadly through our chief academic officers, but also through our partner associations at MICU and MASU. Um, there is already a link on the MCCA events webpage. Um, if you want to register and you, you will be, once we get past the summit, we will be providing much more information about this meeting, um, which we are really looking forward to. I think it, that we have, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've spent so much time working on the virtual meeting format. And I really think that it is starting to bear fruit in terms of, I mean, you can see from the design of this summit, kind of the creativity that we as a staff have been able to bring to this space. And, and particularly, I thank Katie and Erica for helping with that and Precious as well. We're just, you know, we, we continue to try to exploit the limits of what we can do to connect people virtually. And so on October 22nd, we will invite um, our faculty colleagues to experience the next frontier of our creativity in virtual connections. Great, thank you, Jenny. Um, we, as uh, Jenny and Katie talked about strengthening my humanities, I'm gonna transition to talk about strengthening my workforce pathways. And this work is uh, generously funded by the Ascendium Education Group. And it really focuses on a lot of our applied degree programs. Uh, the project is really about strengthening equitable access to and through workforce programs. And as you'll see a little bit later, we're focused on four crucial aspects of workforce programs. One is program design. Um, I think this is particularly important as we're hearing colleges more frequently talk about the impact of the pandemic on their workforce programs, on the workforce needs of their local community. And as we know, over the last 18 months that we have struggled to engage with uh, both traditional age, recent high school graduates and adult students to access and complete our programs, our first strategy really focuses around uh, a select group of colleges that are interested in uh, thinking about their workforce program design. We will be working with several national partners, including the Aspen Institute, the Office of Community College Research and Leadership, and on this project as well, working with the Community College Research Center and our partners at JFF to support colleges participating in this. The second strategy we're focused on um, will support colleges in their work to award academic credit for industry credentials. So of course, many of our workforce programs prepare students to sit for industry credentials. Um, what this work would like to do is flip that back around and help colleges award credit for students who already have those industry credentials. Many colleges do that already, but in our strategy, we will build out the functionality of the Michigan Transfer Network. So not only can colleges award that credit, we can do more to communicate with students and employers about how students can uh, receive credit and how that would translate into an academic program. Our third strategy uh, focuses on building transfer pathways to the bachelor's degree in applied degree programs. Um, you know, there was a one point in the history of community colleges where uh, students got an applied degree program and they may not have needed or got an associate degree in an applied degree program and didn't need to um, go back for further education. And increasingly, students are looking for a bachelor's degree and beyond after they get their applied degree. So we have been uh, working with the community college members of the Transfer Steering Committee and with several university partners across the state who would be willing to accept the entire applied associate degree and the Michigan Transfer Agreement so that students can matriculate into those applied bachelor's degree programs. And then our fourth strategy uh, really focuses on timely advising interventions. Um, one thing that we've learned from folks in our applied degree programs is that uh, these industries are changing rapidly and all of the advising staff on our campuses 
um, would really benefit from and welcome the opportunity to learn more about what it means to work in many of these industries. Um, I can speak for myself that I'd like to learn more about CNC machining. And that's just the type of thing that we would like to do is pull together some resources uh, for colleges to use with their advisor training as they're um, thinking about expanding access uh, to those programs. We are working with a variety of different industry clusters that we're thinking about um, that really kind of go, uh, you know, are available in, in different programs all over the entire community college. Um, and we're still interested if there are some colleges that are interested in doing some of this deeper work with us. Um, we are happy to include you in this project and uh, look for more information in communications from the center moving forward. Uh, in the winter of 2021, uh, if you look on the MCCA events page uh, in January through May, uh, we hosted a series of exploratory webinars that give you some idea of the work that we've done. Um, and that work will continue through at least December of 2023 as um, we work with those colleges to uh, execute all of those strategies that you saw. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Jenny. All right. Are you tired yet? I think we're past the halfway point um, of our initiatives, uh, but i um, excited to share with you some um, information about what we have been doing to help colleges um, tackle the challenges associated with the Michigan Reconnect, um, which if you're um, on this call and you haven't had the opportunity to hear about the Michigan Reconnect Act. Um, I'll try it, you know, and, and hopefully you've been able to hear about it from some people that didn't say bad words while they were talking about it. But the Michigan Reconnect Act um, is a scholarship for adults 25 and over um, to bring people back into community colleges in Michigan to, to make college essentially as much as possible free for those students. Um, and as part of the criteria in the policy bills of that legislation, um, which is a short, shorthand for P, P84 is kind of shorthand for that policy bill. It states that colleges who are going to participate in the Reconnect Scholarship Program have to provide accelerated remediation, remediation by January 1st of 2022. Now, you know, our job has been to try to um, decide and, well, not decide, to clarify for colleges um, if, and what that exactly means. And Erica, if you go to the next one, I think that will be good. So um, we've been trying to work with college leaders and with the uh, labor and economic opportunity to provide clarity and help colleges meet the expectations that are outlined in the act. So we have been having conversations with administrators and faculty um, around the implications of this act in both mathematics and English. Um, we have provided updates to presidents and trustees in February and March and ongoing collaboration with Leo and the staff at the office of 60 by 30. This is a complicated, this is some complicated business for Michigan. Mich Michigan in, with this scholarship is joining um, about a dozen other states who have some kind of legislatively mandated developmental education reform. This is a new situation for us to be in for our 28 independently governed community colleges. So we've been trying to keep that conversation going. And um, especially for our faculty who um, are needing to transition to um, a new way of delivering uh, developmental education. So. The legislation provides options for colleges, but the legislation was the the language in the legislation was written several years ago. So um, since the legislative language was written, um, the research, the national research has coalesced around co-requisite delivery, um, which means that the students take a the developmental support class at the same time as they are taking a gateway college course in either English or math. Um, one of the things that we were able to do at the Center for Student Success was to launch um, a kind of a hybrid uh, academy program 
for faculty who are making these transitions. So we developed this, this virtual academy. Um, we had about 90 plus faculty who participated. And that was really, that's pretty impressive. About um, 17 or 18 colleges sent faculty to the Reconnect Academy. Um, and we were able to facilitate a set of live, we, we put together some resources online and some discussion boards using Canvas. And then we were able to facilitate a set of live virtual sessions, almost all of which were led by Michigan faculty with experience in teaching in the co-requisite format, format. So in, um, in statistics and in quantitative reasoning in the math pathways, um, in English and integrated reading and writing, we, we are fortunate to have some faculty who have been on the leading edge of this and who were able to share their expertise with their colleagues. And that was exciting. We hope to continue to um, have those conversations as faculty go back to their colleges to implement. Um, I was fortunate to be part of, and some of you on the line uh, here today with me, um, fortunate to be part of a working group that um, was delegated to ex to discuss and make recommendations related to placement. So the legislation, the, the Reconnect Act legislation speaks to how they want, how developmental education should be accelerated in delivery. And then it went on to specify that uh, a working group should be formed that would speak to how students should be placed in developmental education. Um, again, 28 community colleges, 28 more or less um, independent and uh, not very well not well coordinated uh, placement policies. Um, that that's that local control issue again. Um, there's been a lot of call over the years for colleges to make a more um, standard student facing statement to our partners in K-12, to our students, to our other stakeholders, business stakeholders about what it means to be college ready. How do you, how do you know if you can take a college class? And so I, we had a group of community college presidents, administrators and faculty, um, some legislators and their staff, uh, business leaders, um, representative from K-12, uh, all convened by uh, the governor's office and uh, Leo um, to talk about the placement recommendations. You can find them on our website on this screenshot here. Um, and you can read the recommendations for yourself, but I'll give you a high level summary of what was included. Um, based on a significant body of national evidence, we brought in um, the, the, the working group brought in um, some experts who have been studying and delivering co-requisite education and also other kinds of remedial education reform um, and presented a significant body of evidence that led the working group to decide to re recommend that colleges should enroll the vast majority of students directly into Gateway English and Mathematics courses with co-requisite support as needed, that that would be the best way to ensure that students are able to complete their Gateway courses in a timely manner and continue to move forward into their program of study. Um, the, the working group recommended that a high school GPA of 2.5 be used as a threshold for taking gateway courses without support. So what does it mean to be college ready in Michigan? It means that you graduated from high school with a GPA of 2.5 um, and that should qualify you for the most part to be in an, a gateway English or math course without support. Now that's not without a certain amount of um, caveats, particularly in the math area, particularly for students who are hoping to pursue a STEM degree. Um, or to pursue a, a, an occupation that requires a STEM degree. Um, so the other thing that the working group recommended was that um, colleges develop guided self-placement processes. So a very uh, what, what the group was picturing was a very kind of student-centered and participatory process for helping students determine beyond whether or not they should be placed in a class with co-rec support or a class without co-rec support, was there more support that they would need? Um, or, you know, students that, for example, might have had a 2.5, but didn't feel they, they were pursuing a STEM uh, occupation, 
and they thought that they might need, maybe they would like to do the, uh, the co-requisite support, even though they were um, technically allowed to do it without. Um, or perhaps their, uh, their high school education was a long time ago and they felt um, uncomfortable and wanted to pursue some other support in by taking that, enrolling in that co-requisite support, or perhaps by enrolling in some kind of boot camp that the colleges, or or extra tutoring or supplemental instruction that the colleges have designed. There's a lot of ways that colleges can use the criteria in the recommendations and the Reconnect Act to provide more support for students that would still allow the students to move more quickly through their um, developmental uh, pro, you know, developmental and gateway courses so that they're not prevented from making progress towards their degree, which, which sometimes happens, which, okay, let's be honest, more often than not seems to happen when students are placed in long sequences of prerequisite developmental programs. The, the research is overwhelming that the students who place near the bottom of those sequences don't get through to the college level course, much less to the completion. Um, so, and also the, the other thing in the recommendations is the idea that we continue to evaluate the effectiveness of the, the approaches that we're putting forward, keeping our ears to the ground on the latest research. That's how this happened, that between the time that the legislation was drafted and the time that the recommendations were created, we, we centered around COREC because that's where the research was going. That doesn't mean that that's where we'll be forever. So we're gonna to continue to evaluate that. Um, so what's next? We're gonna convene a group of stakeholders. We're gonna start meeting next week from colleges and K-12 to provide some guidelines around this high quality guided self-placement project process. There's a lot of um, moving parts to doing this well, eliminating the potential for bias and um, making sure that it does end up being this student-centered centered participatory and successful um, approach to advising and it's going to help. We're, we're going to also need to um, provide some support to the advising community and, and there's a lot of people in Michigan who are serving as student advisors in a lot of different ways and it's going the, the move towards this idea of guided self-placement is going to involve more of those people doing more different things. Um, with students. We're also going to continue to monitor and support colleges who are working to meet that January 2022 deadline to accelerate DevEd per the legislation. Um, we're hoping, we're, we're, look, we're seeking, currently seeking funding and designing a Reconnect 2.0 Academy to provide ongoing support for advisors and for faculty um, to keep, to make sure that we are still there for people as we move to these new models. Um, and we will be using the, um, I, I can't believe that we got all this way into the this presentation and I am the first person to say SOA. Um, we will be using the developmental education scale of adoption assessment. Um, sometime during winter 2022, in, I'll be inviting colleges to um, use that to measure their progress against best practices in developmental education reform. The other piece that we will be doing um, to help with this reconnect implementation as well as other things that we other other initiatives that we are working on is we will be leveraging our mentoring network we have a small group of dedicated faculty and administrators and staff who have uh, been meeting and participating in faculty professional development um, funded by a generous grant for jobs for the future um, and this is a, these are volunteers who have volunteered because they want to help their peers. They have helped out with the scale of adoption assessment for developmental education, for my best, for guided pathways over the past year. Um, we are um, fortunate to have advising from the Student Success Center coaching program and the um, community college research initiatives to keep um, that group of people up to date with best practices in college coaching. And so hopefully, you know, you have had a chance to, if you if you participated in a SOA last fall, you had a chance probably to talk with one or more of our mentors. Um, we're looking forward to more uh, work with this mentoring network in the upcoming year. Phew. 
<laughs> Back to Katie. Thank you. And part of our uh, our mentoring network has been to do some digital community building and actually feature some of our mentors. So you can see on the screen um, several of our digital, we call them our digital leadership circle, hosted a happy hour on Twitter and it was really fun. And how does that work? You wonder, you literally sit with whatever device you're using and grab a drink and then tweet with us. Um, we are still looking to engage with folks online, mentors and otherwise. Um, we have found both Twitter and LinkedIn to be a good opportunity for us to engage with our peers. So you're seeing here some um, LinkedIn examples and we will encourage you to to uh, like and follow us. And I bet one of my colleagues will help me out by adding the uh, links into the chat for the uh, our profile on LinkedIn and then our Twitter profile as well. And I have been tweeting while we've been talking this afternoon. So I would encourage you to join me on Twitter and we could go to the next slide so you can see what we've been up to um, as we've been tweeting. In the early part of the year, before we got really, really busy with other stuff, we were doing what we call tweet chats and we had four in the winter and spring on various topics that were really fun. And then we have had a lot of fun engaging with our colleagues and peers in the state and throughout the country and beyond, honestly, um, with various uh, Twitter activities. And I just wanna draw your attention to Catrice, who you see here on the slide, who we actually met on Twitter. So we had the opportunity to do a PTK tweet chat in March and Catrice was one of the leads on that and she is an international officer with PTK and once I got to see some of um, her tweeting and get to know her a little bit through digital media I knew that we wanted to invite her to be part of our um, our uh, video series that we were doing because her story is incredible so I hope you'll check out her video again um, and uh, feel free to engage she does a lot of cool stuff on Twitter as well she actually retweeted one of our uh, our video uh, tweets earlier this afternoon as well um, so please join us. Thank you uh, to my colleagues for putting those links into the chat. And feel free to check out our uh, the other ways that we would like to communicate is through the um, writing of publications. So earlier this year, two reports came out of the MCSS on our My Best and our transfer work. And you can see those um, at mcca.org. If you toggle over to Center for Student Success, there's a space for um, reports and publications. So you can find those there to download. And then we also have been publishing in other venues that has been uh, kind of fun for us to foray into, one of them being LinkedIn. As I said earlier, we have been giving some space to our mentors and our um, colleagues here at the center as well to do some reflection on LinkedIn. It's, it's a nice way to share information and not have to go through the academic publishing process, if you will. So if any of you in our network are interested in engaging with us through a LinkedIn um, guest blog post, or um, if you start writing something, we would love to see it. And um, so if you follow us and we follow you, then we'll be able to see what you publish. Um, there are a few links in here too that are other mediums that we were invited to uh, author for, including the, the Ferris State uh, uh, perspectives on community college leadership. And then Jenny and I enjoyed writing an article for the CCRC mixed methods blog about our My Humanities work as well. So check us out on online. And um, certainly throughout the week, we will continue to um, be seeing you online, both in Zoom and then um, in some other ways that we'll show you in just a moment. And I am going to kind of close us down by letting you know what to expect the rest of the week. So in addition to uh, a schedule that I'll go through in a moment, you got to see and hear about our videos that are a part of our virtual conference this year. Those are all, if you go to the summit page, um, you will be able to find a, a little button at the top that says videos and the student videos are on top and then the college feature sessions are down at the bottom. There are some of the folks who, who submitted those, those videos on the call today and I must thank you, thank you, thank you for your time and energy putting those sessions together. We, last year's virtual conference was awesome. We had some great workshops um, and virtual sessions, but we didn't get to hear from our colleges and we really, really missed that. So we enjoyed the opportunity to work with a videography firm this year and um, a mul multitude of our colleagues to put together some video sessions that really highlight the student success work that is happening on your campuses that is truly changing the, the game for students throughout our campuses. So we are grateful for your time and I hope that you will take a look at those videos. Um, we will uh, tomorrow be starting the day off at 8.30 with a cooking demonstration. So I hope you'll join us for that. And then the round table sessions at nine and 12 are truly what they say they are. They're round table sessions, an opportunity for you all to talk with one another. Um, we will be pulling from our videos for those round tables, but you don't have to have watched them all to be able to participate in the conversation. 
Um, but I will let you know that that's a little plug maybe to watch them so that you can uh, talk about the content with your peers. And then in the afternoon, we will have a great panel on leadership perspectives on race, health, and student success with several of the presidents from our colleges. On Wednesday, we will again start the day with a My Healthy Lifestyle session, um, joining, you, uh, joining us for a meditation that is just gorgeous. And if you're looking for an opportunity to start your day uh, with some quiet reflection time and see some of our lakes on the screen and some beautiful music, then I hope you'll join us at 8.30. We will again run our roundtables at 9 and 12. These are the same sessions, but you can come to all of them if you like, because you will have the opportunity to talk with different people about some different topics. So we hope to see you at those sessions. And and then we will hear from uh, Lake Michigan College and some of their community partners on how they have made health a priority on campus and in their community uh, Wednesday afternoon. And then Thursday, again, a final, um, the final day of the summit. I will be tweeting about this, but I will invite all of you that are here today to join me for Comfy Clothes Thursday. We will start <laughs> the day with a yoga session, very low key yoga session, by the way, it's not intensive. It will be very restorative. Um, and keep those yoga pants on for the rest of the day because we want to be comfortable as we end the week together. We'll get to hear lots more from Precious and her colleagues who have been working so hard with their My Best work and um, see some great videos as part of her session. And then I can't say enough good things about our keynote speaker, Dr. Hammonds. If you joined us last um, summer for the session she did on trauma-informed advising, I'm sure you got a lot out of it, both professionally and personally. I said it felt like a big group therapy session and we asked her to center wellness um, on her keynote remarks. And I think that you'll really enjoy hearing from her and working together through some of um, the trauma that we've experienced over the last year and putting ourselves first so that we can put others um, right behind us and, and make sure that we're providing good support for them. I've already asked you to come join us on Twitter and LinkedIn. I'll ask again because there's money on the line for you. Um, because we can't give tchotchkes away and provide you with free food during this year's summit, we're doing a daily hashtag raffle. You can use either LinkedIn or Twitter to use our hashtag, which is hashtag MyHealthyColleges21. Um, or maybe come be close Thursday, as Jenny put in the chat. I, I could probably come up with something for that as well. Um, but we'd like to hear from you. What, what are you taking away from your sessions? Some of our presenters are interested in engaging with you on social media. Feel free to ask them questions in either platform. And if you use that hashtag, you will automatically be put into our raffle. And we will be um, the prizes will be uh, $50 Spa Finder gift cards. I've received several of these throughout my life, and they're really nice because you can use them at any participating local wellness establishment. Establishment. So I have typically used them for massages, but you can also typically use them at yoga studios or other uh, wellness or fitness places. So um, join us for the daily hashtag raffles simply by using the hashtag and tweeting about your experience at the conference. And then, uh oh, um, if we go back to that, I don't know what's going on with the graphic, but it's showing up. Let me see if it works. You should be able to use the camera on your smartphone um, it is not, we need to have more of that um, picture on the screen. However, Precious has very kindly put the link to the, uh, the session evaluation into the chat. So you can grab that link there. Um, all, it is the same evaluation for all of the sessions. So don't get confused by that. You can submit it more than once. You will be asked to select which session you're evaluating. We do take your feedback um, seriously. Um, we don't know why you like this session the best every year. I guess it's because I'm hilarious. Um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Not really, um, but we think you should definitely evaluate all of the sessions so that we know how you feel about the content and it helps us get better both with our summit uh, programming and other programs that we plan throughout the year. You can also contact us if you would like to give us kudos or complain. We will take your complaints as well. Um, <laughs> feel free to reach out to us via email or via social media. We would love to, again, hear from you um, and engage with you online. Jenny is also hilarious. We're all hilarious. It's the end of a long day. We're a little slap happy at this point. Colleagues, is there anything further you'd like to say before we shut down for the afternoon? Excellent. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you for what all of you do. And here's to a great week together.